What I loved about watching trailers and reruns of your cable access show that you have on your YouTube channel was the comments that were also the, how people really related to you and they felt a, a kinship and they wanted to call because back in the day, of course, there were no you know, YouTube. And what was something that someone said that you, it, it changed you? One of these messages? Oh, something positive. I had, I had a father uh, call with a heavy Middle Eastern accent. And he said, oh, well, I have to back up. I did a show where I wore a little girl dress with crinolines and my hair was up in pigtails and bows. And, and I had a face that could pass, you know, for a little girl. And it was so cute. And aw. So I talked as if I were an adult explaining what it's like to be shamed by adults and the trauma and how it's hard to really believe in myself. And I hear no so much. And, and it's always like a, when I'm in my most excited that I get yelled at, oops, I forgot to watch and how it makes me like shrink into myself. And, and, and I don't understand when I'm being hit, like what I could have done and how I could, I'll do it better. I, I don't know what I've done, but I'll do it better. I'll do it. I won't I'll stop, whatever. But I did it all with comedy because my comedy wellness brand was started back then. I just didn't know it was called a brand, you know? So um, this, this man said, when he watched my show, and it was like 22 minutes, it made him understand what his children went through when he yelled at them and when he hit them. Oh, wow. And he was determined to change it. And I knew that it's hard to stop doing a show, even though it doesn't pay you nothing when you get calls like that. And also, oh, um, okay. So I'm, I don't know what, like 25 years sober at the time. And I'm at a meeting, I'm speaking and a woman follows me in and she's like, can I talk to you? And at that point I'm like, is this about my ex-husband? Oh no, this is happened a few years ago. <laughs> Cause that women have stopped me to tell me, oh, don't ask dash and dying. Don't ask. Anyway. So, um, so she said, no, I just need you to know that my husband and I used to watch a show while we were on crack. And, um, and then one day we said, we should try a meeting. And they've been sober ever since. So it's like I planted the seeds and I did it with comedy because that's how I like to learn. I like to laugh. I don't want to be, I don't want to be lectured. Um, if you can make me laugh, you have me, you know? And you wrote the book, um, that now will be turned into, it'll be adapted into a movie called Trauma Land. When you wrote the book, um, it was all comedy based as well. You were trying to make light of a serious situation. Yeah, but I, w I was too angry and resentful to make it really funny at first. <laughs> I needed, I needed to release a lot of that. Like I said, release the commas. Um, but then, uh, um, the shorter it got, the funnier it got. I was trying to make a, a comedy wellness reduction sauce, you know, just, <laughs> just bring it in to just the, the, the yeah. Condense and then, it. Yeah. yeah. And the screenplay, that's where it's, I call it a comedy, just a dark comedy because, um, the, whenever it gets like heavy, there's a big laugh right after. I don't want a stressful movie. And because I'm able to make it funny, uh, it was just a matter of like, you know, what actually moves the story along and what is the funniest. That's what remained. And then, then you get your actual, because yeah, we do in the movie, uh, we flash back to my parents in Poland and my most disgusting and pathetic alcohol years. And although there's nothing funny about the Nazis, my mother and father, especially my mom, she had a way of like, uh, this is me. I, I, uh, mom, did you just make that up? And she said, yeah. And I go, Oh, I have to write that down. <laughs> That's how she was. And so we use those little gems and my sister who we talked about, who, you know, we, we are not close did say something that almost made me like, belch. <laughs> she said, she thanked me for the writing, writing the book. She said it brought Ma back. So she read it over and over again, just to make my mother come alive again. 
Though I did, my mother was so in my head, it's, it, it was kind of hard. Ma, me, there's a difference of a vowel, you know? So it was kind of hard. Yeah, she has a very distinct voice, which is why casting the movie is going to be interesting. I wonder who's going to end up playing Manya, because this darling Holocaust survivor who's so just so bright and adorable, and she was really my inspiration. And that's why I wanted to change my name back to her sister, who died in a gas chamber, which is one reason I changed my name from Hanala to Susan. I forgot to say, I was born Hanala, not Susan. Oh. My sister looked at me and went, oh, let's name it Susan. Hanala's way too Jewish. And you didn't want to finish the book while she was still living? No, I very much wanted to oh, finish did? it. Oh. <laughs> I so much wanted to finish it. Um, I, I, uh, she gave me the finish. Uh, we were alone in the hospital, um, but I won't go there because I will definitely cry and give away the uh, an important scene. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how many times you've pitched the idea for Trauma Land and, and, and what was the response and then why now? Uh, um, I don't think I would have finished the script for Trauma Land, had I not had this track record with Elvis and Nixon, um, starring Michael Shannon and Kevin Spacey and people talk, I used to say Kevin Spacey and Michael Shannon, by the way. Um, if they don't know, it won the Tribeca 2016 centerpiece. That's like the prize. So based on that, I was inspired to do this, uh, to finally finish it. I've been working on the screenplay since the book came out. Oh, trying you to have. adapt 2006. that. Oh, oh that's so many. Oh. 700,000 drafts. So, <laughs> not really, not really. Uh, but it just oh. felt that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's a, a lot of drafts, a lot of. So, but but uh, just starting over, too. Just And what I would do is I would take like master classes, screenwriting. I'd watch film courage. I'd get tips. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, especially um, when it came to writing a synopsis or summary, I actually, I would watch your channel. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you know, as part of that work, we integrated. So and actually used. Absolutely. So, um, and here's what happened. Um, other people seem to believe it too. Like, wow. You wrote and co you co-wrote and co-produced uh, Elvis and Nixon. Now the truth is that I had been uh, given this offer that if I could complete a really good script about the meeting when Nixon met Elvis, uh, I could uh, actually perhaps get it produced. So I had a deadline. So for 30 days, uh, first of all, back then, this was about uh, five years ago, Six, six years ago, maybe, what I did was I, I had to order the DVDs from Netflix to research this meeting that Elvis had with Nixon. I didn't know anything about it. So I saw all the, uh, the people who were there talk about it. And one of the, the guys that I, I saw was Jerry Schilling. And he said he was there for the whole meeting. And I went, and the whole trip and everything. It was a really interesting story. And I also read Priscilla Presley's book and that changed everything. That gave me motive. And so I, uh, I thought, I got, I got it. I don't want to write a screenplay about dead Elvis. Boo hoo. You know, I liked Elvis. I, I don't want to write, well, yeah, it was a, that's a tragic end. So what I did was I had just written two screenplays that I never even bothered pitching because I thought they were getting produced and it fell through that were buddy flicks. And I went, I'm going to do it about Jerry. And that's how I came up with the idea of how to format the screenplay and everything. So I, I wrote the screenplay and then Carrie Elways wanted uh, to direct it. And then he added a, a little bit and became one of the co-writers. But I'm the one who, who fleshed out that story. I'm very proud of it. So I'm glad that we're able to use that to get us to the next level with Trauma Land. That's why I finished it, because I had a feeling that people would pay attention to a produced screenwriter. Elvis and Nixon took you one month to write? It was a challenge? For, it's a one-month challenge? Uh, well, I think, I think that all in all, from when I started the first page, 
Yeah, it was, it was a month. And we had a director at the time. So I would send him my pages every night. And I found that was helpful too. Oh, yeah. so he was almost like a sponsor, like a, yeah. accountable. Yeah, okay. every oh, night. Nice. Wow. I couldn't take a day off oh. because Ryan was expecting a page or two. And I was inspired. Plus, I found out I really love write, putting words in men's mouths. <laughs> okay. Get in there. Stay in there. Use them. <laughs> so I, um, I, I enjoy writing for men, uh, men's roles. And so that was like more fun for me. Like I said, I'd already warmed up on two other screenplays. And um, I felt like I knew Elvis. I was already doing Elvis songs, like in my band, I Sing Suspicious Minds. And I was born the day Elvis got his first gold record and he recorded, I want you, I love you, I need you. Is that the way it goes? I'm dyslexic. It's one of those. It's <laughs> all, all of them, but not necessarily necessarily in that order. So um, I, I I think that as a fetus, I heard Elvis, and then my parents never had air conditioning, so the windows were open in the summer because I was born in April. Okay. And so I think um, I was born into Elvis. And so I when when it came to writing him, and also I had uh, the Elvis impersonator behind me. Sure. I really, really, really want this badge. <laughs> and, um, the, so I, I enjoyed writing it. It was actually so much more fun than writing about the Holocaust and alcoholism. I cannot tell you. Did you watch a lot of, of reruns or tapes or whatever? You know, like, um, I mean, YouTube was... When, when were you writing this? YouTube wasn't this around This was then? 2011. So YouTube was around. Yeah. yeah, but it didn't have any. Uh, YouTube did not have anything on this uh, no. meeting between Elvis and Nixon. That's interesting. Maybe a couple of videos, maybe a couple. But I had to. Uh, uh, I, I had Netflix at the time, and they had the uh, the DVDs, the, the DVDs mm -hmm. from the National Archives, and also. I heard that the most requested photo of the National Archives was of Elvis and Nixon shaking hands in the Oval Office. So it's like, okay, so that became like a big part of it. And with the dialogue, when you went back in for revisions, were you cutting a lot of it down? Because you know how Elvis had a very specific very specific way he spoke, and so did Richard Nixon. Oh, we had a lot of different drafts. I kept writing it and writing it, and then what happened was I never knew if it was going to get produced. Even though I was being paid uh, option money, you, know, you don't know. It could have gone away. And then one day I get a call, you know, that it's get, getting made. So it was like years between, and I had no idea, right? But about three three years maybe, after I wrote it and totally given up, except for the option money, I decided to submit it to a film festival, the Page Screenwriting Festival. And I got notified after submitting that there were 5,000 entries. So like I stopped checking the emails. And then one day I get a phone call and they say, aren't you interested that you've made it into the finals? And I'm like, but I, I'm blocking your emails now because it was spam. Like, no, we were trying to get a hold of you to tell you you've been in the quarterfinal, not quite, but I can't even say if quarterfinals, semifinals, finalists, whatever, however it works again, dyslexia. But um, yeah, we, we made it into the top 100 and it did, we didn't win, but it was a finalist. That script. And I'd been working on it the whole time. So that's, you know, uh, like not with the other two guys, that was just mine. But I did put their names on it because I had to. You know, they uh, at one point did put in a word or two, I guess. <laughs> so I, um, uh, I gave up on, on all of that after the, uh, the thing didn't win and didn't touch it again. And then I got the phone call that Kevin Spacey's been cast and uh, the movie's a go. 